주시옵소서 about Jesus <laughs> yeah uh, John chapter 4 verse 23 I'm going to show you this this is Jesus conversation with the Samaritan woman about the place to worship geographically which Jesus uh, starts talking about what the new covenant is here. And he said, the hour is coming when the, and, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seek such or is seeking such to worship him. And this is what's powerful. I was meditating on this last night. The word seeking or seek in the old King James simply means to crave. God's craving such the word. This is talking about new covenant worship. You understand that they could not worship him in spirit and truth like we can in the new covenant because that before the cross, they weren't born again. We can do that. And, and when it hit me, the father, you know how foreign it was for them under the old covenant to call God your father? This is amazing. But we can do this. We can give the father what he's craving, and that's our love. Isn't that powerful? I just think that's awesome. So let's give it to him. Let's give him that love that he loves us so much. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Sometimes you gotta dance through the darkness, sing through the fire, praise when it don't make sense. Sometimes you gotta dare down the giant, worship from the lion's den. Sometimes you gotta shout it from the mountain, louder than the valley, just in that he's gonna get you there. Sometimes you gotta welcome the wonder, wait for the answer, worship you with your hands in the air. I'll praise you anyway and praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Sometimes you gotta praise in the prison, cry out to heaven, shout till the doors swing wide. Sometimes you gotta dance on the shackles, brave in the battle, worship with your hands held high. I'll praise you anyway. Give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Close your eyes this morning. Just put your focus on him today, on his love for you. Oh, yes. Here and now I draw a boundary against every weapon that's formed. Oh 
I plead the blood I plead the blood of Jesus It's more than enough I plead the blood of Jesus My shield My shield and my shelter It's my defense I claim it over and over again as I plead the blood as I plead the blood of Jesus thank you Jesus This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have with thee. Breath that I take. 
You know, back in the day, it used to be like when people would give a prophecy, it would be like, yay, and you, and you. We don't do that, right? <laughs> God doesn't talk that way, but it's okay. It just comes through our expression. But as we we're sitting there worshiping, I started thinking what I said earlier about John chapter 4, the Father craves such to worship him. And I started thinking the Greek word there for worship is, is a Greek word proskuneo, and it means to kiss the hand or to kiss towards Jesus. And then I, thought, so I saw Psalms 2.12 where it says, Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they who put their trust in him. And I thought, because of Jesus, we can kiss the father. We can, as we kiss the son because of what, what he's done. This is amazing. This is what God craves. This is relationship. This is fellowship. Glory to God. What a word. Have a seat, please. Glory to God. That's exciting to me. I marvel at how much God speaks. And I want to tell you, the main way that God speaks is through His Word. Don't let anybody try to deter you from the Word of God. Because the Lord showed me the more words you put in you, the more, the Holy, the more you're giving the Holy Spirit the raw material He needs to be able to speak to you. Amen? God will never speak anything to you that contradicts His Word. Ever. That's how you can tell. I was dealing with a guy this week, and long story short, but he basically thought he was Jesus. And I said, no, if you're born again, you're one spirit with him, but you're not Jesus. And he said, oh, he's the chosen. I said, well, then do we have to put faith in you? And I said, why well, ain't doing it? You're not Jesus. <laughs> you know, If you're truly born again, which it's doubtful because you're demonized, but we can cast those out, uh, uh, you are one spirit, but you're not him. He is the son of God. And if you've received him, you're born again and you become a son of God. We become one spirit with him, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. But to say that salvation is through you is blasphemy. Thank you for that thunderous grunt. <laughs> hey, I got a good joke today, so it's gonna, it'll, it'll clear all the... Well, yeah, thanks to Tom and Lisa, they inspired me to share it. <laughs> all, right, all right. We're going to receive the offering. <laughs> what a, giving is a privilege do you have to give no it's a privilege you get to give it really is and you know i sit there and i think about when we leave this earth money's not going to matter when we leave this earth but on, on the, in the meantime we're living in this earth and 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 my wife and i we've been where jesus said in matthew chapter 6 you cannot serve god and mammon mammon ha was basically a demon god that wants us to trust in what earthly monetary currency instead of trust in him god knows we need money to accomplish things in this life but he wants our trust to be in him amen so so giving is an opportunity yes and jen's holding up the sign don't forget the special fund we are still putting a shelter up there look how big that sign is <laughs> it's like massive with coffee spilled down it yeah I had too much in my hands today, and, and one of them was a coffee, and so it just kind of, and thanks, Jace, he helped me out. So this is an opportunity. Say, I'm blessed because of what Jesus has done, for I know the grace of my Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for my sake he became poor, that I through his poverty might be made rich. And God is able to make all grace abound toward me, that I having all sufficiency... In all things, 
may abound to every good work. That's what God says. That's what God says. You know, what does the mirror say? If you're born again, that's what God says. It's your words in agreement with what he said. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. We get what we say from, from a believing heart. Now, it, you know, when people say, I'm dying to have a piece of pie, I'm, you don't believe that, right? So you don't fall over dead. But I'm saying the words out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is why we need to renew our mind and we need to agree with God with our words. We need, it. we need to do that. We need to sow to persuade. We need to speak to persuade our heart, and then we will speak from a persuaded heart. Are you hearing me? We need to do that. We need to set a watch, O oh Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Death and life are somewhere in the power of the Lord. No, in the power of your tongue. That's what God said. So I'm just telling you what he said. So if you get mad, take it up with him. <laughs> okay. Amen. So whenever you're ready, you're blessed. Jennifer. My beautiful wife has a word. You know, when you just have a God dream, and I had a God dream a couple nights ago, and I'm going to make a long story short, not go into the whole (laughs) dream, because I think it was more significant for me than it would be for you. But basically, in the end, there was there was a woman that was just persecuting me, and I knew she was persecuting me for my leadership stance and whom I am married to, and I mean, I was just exasperated. I did not know how to get this lady off my back, and finally, finally, I just pointed at her, and I just started praying over her things of God. And we know in Romans 12, 14, it says to bless those who persecute you, to, to bless and to curse not. So I started praying over her that the word of God would come to life to her wherever she went, calling forth the word of God for her, okay? And I just started praying that she would see her need to be under correct leadership. And I mean, just, just praying that, you know, biblical things like that, you know, people have to come to the end of themselves, right? Yeah. So, and just praying, and as I did that, she melted. And I'm like, that was so significant. A lot of times we get upset and we want to, you know, get in the ring with people or whatever, but you got to pray, you got to have a direction, a pinpoint direction from the Lord, and it's going to line up biblically. Yeah, amen. So just wanted to share that. Praise God. You know, I remember, that's mine. I remember Brother Hagen saying, well, I'm going to turn this other one. On. 
I just want to encourage everybody because sometimes uh, we come into the church and uh, we think that we can't be happy and we can't uh, be joyous and give each other high fives. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, sorry, Chris, I gave I gave Tom a high five while you were talking, uh, but it, but it's because I'm just excited for the Lord, and and that's what I want to encourage you guys is you can be excited for the Lord. You don't have to sit and and be quiet. You don't have to be quiet. I love Lisa always clapping when she hears something that touches her heart. So be happy, be joyous, and let it out if you want to. It's okay. Like Chris is encouraged when you are given an amen. amen. So there's my word. <laughs> Good word, Jace. You know, I wanted to say something in line with what Jen was saying earlier too, even about taking authority. And I remember the story of Brother Hagen years ago, and, and he said in this vision, there was this demon kept screaming and hollering, and, and the Lord was sitting there saying, well, like when you, or Brother Hagen was saying, when are you going to do something about this demon? When are you going to do something? And he realized that God wasn't going to do anything about the demon, that he gave him authority to do something about the demon and to take his authority. And, you know, so it's important that we understand those things because if we don't, I was sitting there thinking, you cannot not be mad at God if you think God could do something and for some sovereign reason he's not to. You will be mad at God on a heart level. You have to be, but that's not God. God has given us authority. And so we need to know that. I'm going to switch mics here. Uh, the classes are released. Hallelujah. I think I'm on. And am I on? <laughs> You're lit. No, I'm just kidding. This is, this is a joke that I think is pretty funny. Amen. Uh, it's, uh, it says, well, let's pray first. Father, we love you and we thank you. Lord, I just adore you and lord i we kiss we kiss the sun lord we 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 kiss you we love you we praise you and lord i'm just asking you just have your way through everything i say everything we do through our fellowship lord anything you want to do this is your service jesus is lord of this church and um and and of our lives and we just thank you for it in jesus mighty name and everyone said amen so all the classes are released that are needed to be this is so good a preacher wanted to know what his teenage son would be in his future life, so he thought he would give his son a test. He put on his son's dresser, dresser a Bible, and if he took the Bible, it meant he would be a preacher. Then he put a silver dollar by the Bible, and if he took the silver dollar, it meant he would be a banker. Then he put a bottle of whiskey, and, uh, and if he took the, that, it meant he was going to be a worthless drunk. And then he put a Playboy magazine by those things, and if he took that, it meant he was going to be a womanizer. Then the preacher hid in the closet waiting for his teenage son to come in. The teenage son came in, looked at the four items, and picked them all up and carried them out. And the father said, dear God, the boy's going to run for Congress. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's funny. I don't care who you are. All right. Let's get into this. So this is, this is really powerful. This is part two of, of the anatomy of a disciple. God's called us. We mentioned this last week. I'm going to keep the review real short because I'm hoping to make some tracks as we get into the signs of a disciple, a disciple of Jesus. Now, you can be a disciple of a church. You can be a disciple of a, of a particular group. You can be a disciple of a lot of things. And the word disciple in its simplest form just means a learner. A learner, someone, and I, I mentioned this last week, it's someone who emulates or imitates the one they're being discipled after. And the goal of this church, our vision, is to convert converts into disciples of Jesus, not disciples of True Life Church. Amen. Can anybody hear the difference? Amen. There's a massive difference because a lot of times we get people more excited about our church than we do about Jesus. Yeah. And, and a good church points you to Jesus. Amen. I believe in having a church. I mean, there's nothing wrong with, you know, what we're doing, all that. That's all great. But, but the emphasis has to be the Word of God. Jesus is the living Word of God. The Scriptures are the written Word of God. They reveal Jesus. So that is the goal. And that is the Great Commission mission that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, right at the end of that. He said, go and make disciples. We talked about that last week. Not converts. Now, I understand Making converts is important, right? They need to be born again. 
truly born again. Amen? Amen. And just because somebody says a prayer doesn't mean they believed it. Yeah. And I'm not God, but I'm saying, I, I tell, for example, in the jail ministry, I, I, I basically beg people, don't you say a prayer because of me. Yeah. I'm not on your back. I don't want you to just parrot some words and not believe it in your heart. Because if, and if you're truly a convert, you need to be discipled. And I'm getting more blunt about this because I'm realizing that in our culture, this is what's crippling the world is we got so many professing Christians that don't really, they're really not discipled. They need to be discipled. And I'm going to show you this. Uh, I'm constantly being discipled after Jesus. Amen. Amen. And I'm constantly seeking to grow. I, one of our greatest enemies is what we already know. Yes. If you already know something, you can't learn anything. Because you'll shut down that. Listen, you got to take the attitude, Lord, I need, what am I not seeing here? I'm seeing stuff in Scripture from places I've been many times. It's endless. You can't exhaust it. You can't exhaust it. And if you're a disciple, you start realizing that. Amen. For example... One of the things that God has called me to do in, in my, uh, uh, my, whatever you want to say, my pattern, if you will, my habits, is, is I make sure I listen to Andrew Womack's daily broadcasts. I can finish a lot of Andrew's stories when he starts them. I've heard them many times, but I get blessed every single time. You know why? Because number one, the anointing, and number two, my heart, I, I strive to not think I know any, I, I refuse to say, well, I already know that. I got that. I'm good. That's what stops you because it's more than just information. It's revelation. See, a disciple realizes this. And we're going to get into this. Let me, let me get in the outline and let's do the review quick because I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the review. Talked about the True Life Church vision, converting converts into disciples. And then I mentioned this. A disciple is more than a student who gains just the information. That's part of it. But, but rather one who imitates the lifestyle of their teacher. And as I said, disciples after Jesus. We talked about that. And then under uh, uh, letter F there, uh, the danger of being discipled after men. We talked about that out of Acts chapter 20, 28 through 30. And where Paul warned that people would rise up from within and they would come from without. And their goal would be to draw away disciples after themselves. And so we got to discern the difference in our relationship with God. Amen? Yes. Well, I was going to say something, but I'm going to move on. <laughs> All right, the next one. Discipleship, we talked about this, will cost something. The lordship of self. Last week I made this statement. It's from some old timer. I read it years ago. Salvation is free. Discipleship costs. Salvation is free. Discipleship costs. And there's the scriptures there out of Luke 6. Luke 14 Verse 26, verse 25 on, he talks about the counting the cost of discipleship. Amen. This is what God has, has commanded the church is to make disciples. Not con All division that we have is because people aren't discipled. I'm going to say something big here and some of you will hear it. Hopefully all of you will hear it. Not just the sound waves, but you will actually hear what, what I'm saying. Is I go, it's amazing to me how few Christians actually believe the Bible. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, everybody here does. They mo many times they believe what their favorite teacher says about the Bible. Now, I'm not saying you reject that. You, you do it. But, but what does the Bible say? For example, I don't believe something just because Andrew Womack says it. I love Andrew. But I believe it because I have to see it in the Word. And I have to study it and meditate on it and, and pray in the Spirit and allow God to show it to me. Because I've done that. We've all done that. Amen? So, so it's important. Like what you hear today, be a Berean. Remember the Bereans in Acts 17? And how they were more nobler than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word that Paul brought. But they searched the Scriptures daily to see if those things were so. They search the scriptures on Easter and Christmas to see it. No, they search the scriptures daily. We're going to see this. A disciple is someone who's in love with the word of God. I asked the Lord one time, I said, what does it mean to love Jesus? He said, you love the word. He is the word. I said, well, you love the book. No, you love, what's, you love the spirit that's in the word of God because you see it, you hear it, you're amazed at it. 
You know what the word rhema is, revealed word? One of the definitions I, I found in my, in my studies is it's, it's something that arouses talk because it is remarkable and noteworthy. A rhema word of God, when you get revelation from the word, it's something that arouses talk because it's remarkable and noteworthy. The reason many believers talk about each other and they love the drama of this world is because they're not getting any rhema from God. Amen. <laughs> that's tight, but that's right. Amen? If you're getting rhema from God, you don't want to talk about your brothers and sisters. You want to talk about the word of the living God. You're excited about the word. That's revelation. Rhema, that's what you live on. When the Bible says... In Matthew 4, 4, when Jesus, when he was being tempted by the enemy, he said, man shall not live by bread alone or just natural sustenance, but by every rhema word of God proceeding out of the mouth of God, the Greek says. In other words, that's how you're going to live. Living is more than just existing. Living is a quality of life. It's full of life. It's full of excitement. I don't know how people live without a relationship with God. You know how they live? They exist. That's not living. Well, you don't understand I'm going through this. Listen to me. Here's a clue phone. We're all going through something. We were talking about that uh, before we came out. You know what I've learned about life? If it ain't one thing, it's another. <laughs> you may as well rejoice in the Lord always. Amen. Paul and Silas could have said when they were in jail, man, we did the work. Once we get out of jail, we're going to be happy. No, you won't. There will be something else. <laughs> That's life in the fallen world. You can rejoice right now, right where you're at. I even asked God one time, uh, and, and I said, you know, someday I'm going to be content. And I thought, why not now? <laughs> Godliness with contentment is great gain. Yes. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. All right, let's, so, so discipleship costs the Lordship itself. Now, let's get into it. Signs of a disciple. There's basically three signs. I don't know how far we're going to get on each one. The first one, disciples of Jesus hear God accurately. Now, this is big because I'm going to say some things. I'm going to try to connect some things to it. Number one, the value of God's voice. Go to 1 Kings 3, 9. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9. This is where Solomon had the dream. Remember that? He had a dream and, and basically God came to him and said, whatever you want, ask and I'll give it to you. <laughs> How many of you know most of us would have been, whoo, I can think of a lot of things. Give me this skyscraper, this. <laughs> oh. But he didn't. Well, look what Solomon asked. He valued hearing God. Now watch this. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 19. It says, therefore give unto your servant. No, I'm sorry, verse 9. Therefore given, I said you were right the first time. Therefore give to your servant, this is Solomon. God ask him anything you want, ask. Now watch this. And, and this, we're going to see that this speech was so pleasing to God, it's amazing. Therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people. Stop. The word understanding is a Hebrew word that literally means a hearing heart. Now watch this. So I can be a good leader to your people. Notice he said, Lord, let me hear so I can be a blessing to the people. It wasn't all about him. Wow. Wow. So th that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this, this great uh, uh, people of yours. Now look at this. This speech, he said, Lord, I want to be able to hear you so I can be a blessing to people. And this speech was so pleasing to God that, that the Lord said to him, not only will I give you what you requested, but even what you didn't request. This is so powerful. See, a disciple is someone who, hear, who seeks to hear the voice of God, but not just for him or herself, because they understand that their call is to be a blessing to people. Their number one call is to know the Lord, and out of that knowing is to be a blessing to God's people and to people that need to know God. Amen? Amen. Powerful. Look at this. Back to your outline. <clears throat> Disciples of Jesus hear God accurately. Now, let me say this to you. Well, go to, go to uh, I'm going to couple a couple things here. I talk about this a lot, but you need to hear this a lot. And, you, and it's everywhere. Go to Jeremiah 6.10. <clears throat> you can go back to the old King Jim if you want. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Everybody say hear. Disciples hear God accurately. 
Behold, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot hearken or hear. Now stop. I've often said this. I'm not a physician. But I'm sh pretty sure male circumcision does not occur on your ear. <laughs> Some of you will get that. You'll be driving home. Ah, I get it. <laughs> circumcision was a sign of covenant. Are, are you hearing me? In a covenant, there's representation. Everybody say representation. representation. In our covenant, Jesus is our covenant representation. David and Goliath, you remember this story in 1 Samuel 17. Remember, David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? In fact, go there. Go to 1 Samuel 17, and we'll come back here to Jeremiah 17, 10. Go to 1 Samuel 17, verse 26. I just want to show you this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. And David spake to the men that stood by him. This is when he went out to see his, his father Jesse had sent him out to bring supplies to his brothers, saying, what shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine? Referring to Goliath. Goliath represented the Philistines, right? And taketh away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? This means, Goliath, you don't have a covenant with God. Amen. When circumstances come against us, what is this uncircumcised circumstance that is coming against me? I've got a covenant with God and that covenant's name is Jesus. Now this is big because this is what it means to look at Jesus. Well, most people look at Jesus. He was an histor historical figure. He was a nice guy. He, he modeled a great life, even his miracles. No, it's looking at Jesus as my covenant with God. <coughs> All right, now look, next verse. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that kills him. Now, the, the, I want you to see this verse. This is David's oldest brother. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? He's starting to accuse him. You know, when you start talking about Jesus as your covenant with God, you're going to get persecution. You're going to get blowback because the devil doesn't want you to know that Jesus is your covenant with God. Oh, you can know about Jesus, but don't accept him as your covenant relationship with God. He, he's not your rep. You are. I'm getting on something. For those that have ears to hear, let them hear. Is your ear circumcised? And it says, look at this. Kindled against David, why camest down hither? And, and look at this. And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? Do you hear the, 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 the derogatory, the, the demeaning, the condescending attitude that Eliab's accusing David? David left the sheep with the keeper. Those few sheep, who are you? You're nothing. I think it's amazing. And, it's, and it says, I know the pride. Here he's accusing him. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of your heart. For you have come down that you might have seen the battle. David said, is there not a cause? And David turned and spoke to another. He didn't argue with somebody who was determined to misunderstand him. What a lesson for you and I. When you start talking about Jesus as your covenant with God, I'm telling you, people are going to come, demons are going to be stirred up in people to come against you. Guaranteed. Because say, we have no comprehension of covenant in the West. We don't. I heard a man of God say this, the more civilized we become, the more uncivilized we are. Yeah. A man's word don't mean anything. People lie all the time. Yeah. The Bible says in, in uh, um, Psalm 89, verse 34, my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Yeah. God, can, God won't, he can't. He would have to deny his son. That's your covenant with God. Now go back to Jeremiah 6.10. Watch this. This is, this is big. This is part. If you're a disciple, you're going to hear on a covenant frequency. You're going to hear on a covenant frequency. You're going to hear that you, you, you are blessed because you're in covenant with God through Jesus. You're going to hear that you're blessed because God can't deny you because he would have to deny Jesus. You're going to hear this. It's not going to be, did I confess it enough? Did I do this right enough? Did I do? See, that's all about you. <laughs> to whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised. They don't understand this. They cannot hearken. Look at this. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach, and they have no delight in it. 
Think about that. Listen, you know when, when uh, in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, you know this, this book of the law, the Lord instructed Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of, the, out of thy mouth, but you shall meditate there in day and night that you may observe to do all that is written therein. For then shall you make your way prosperous and then shall you have good success. This book of the law was the book of the covenant. Hallelujah. This is so powerful. So powerful. But this is the essence of looking at Jesus. Go back to your outline. Well, before we do that, look at this. <laughs> Go to Exodus 2.24. These are some verses. I, look, I write these outlines. I meditate on them and I keep writing. It just, I don't stop. That's why I'm trying not to look at it too much. <laughs> and God heard their groaning. This was his children. His covenant people under the old covenant. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. This was before the law. He remembered this covenant. And the Bible says in the new covenant, if you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed, and you're heirs according to the promise. We have covenant rights with God because Jesus is our covenant representation with God. God cannot lie. He cannot lie to me. He cannot lie to you. But our ears are so uncircumcised because we live in an uncircumcised culture that doesn't understand covenant and that lying is not a part of it. Look at this. Isaiah 26.3. You know this verse. I'm going to show it to you though. And then I'm going to connect two things. See, this is part of hearing accurately. If you have a circumcised ear, if you understand that Jesus is your covenant with God, you can hear God's voice accurately. Mm -hmm. Thou, we know this verse. Thou will keep him in shalom, shalom, the Hebrew says. Perfect peace whose mind, his imagination, his conception is stayed upon thee because he trusts in thee. Now watch this. How's your mind to be stayed upon him? Keep your finger there and jump over to 1 Chronicles 16, 15. Mark got it. Now, so we're to keep our mind stayed upon him, right? Be mindful always of his covenant. The word which he commanded. See, the covenant and word are used interchangeably. You see that? Yep. Psalm 105 verse 8 says the same thing. You see it? They're interchangeable. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the Word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.14, 1, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, even the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Be mindful of His covenant. The Word, in the beginning was the Word. The Word became... Are you hearing me? The Word was with God. The Word was God. Are you seeing it? This is a circumcised ear. Be mindful. Be mindful. Be, have your mind full always of Jesus as your covenant with God. That's why you pray in the name of Jesus. Most people think it's just the cute little thing you say at the end of your prayer. Remember the seven sons of Sceva? Acts 19, I believe it is. <laughs> I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. They said the name of Jesus, right? Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And jumped on him and beat him up. Right? Be mindful always of the covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. This is so powerful. When you see this, I'm telling you, it changes everything. This is how we limit God. So disciples hear God accurately. Go to John chapter 10 verse 27. John 10, 27, Jesus speaking, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my father's voice. Now that, does that mean we can't miss it? Listen, we're all seeing through a glass darkly, but if we never get revelation, if we never see anything in the word, if nothing ever jumps at us, am I a sheep or a goat? I don't want to assume everybody's born again. I think we all are. The, but man, if, if the word of God's not exciting to me, I may be born again, but am I a disciple? 
Am I, am I learning? Am I growing? Am I emulating Jesus? Jesus said stuff like, I don't do anything except what I see my father do, John 5, 19. <laughs> I don't do anything except what I hear him say. John 5, 30 talks about that. That's a paraphrase. But my point is, Jesus said it was the father in him that did the works, John 14, 10. We're supposed to emulate that. And we can. He's given us the grace to do that. But see, the reason we're condemned is because we're not hearing on covenant frequency. This is powerful. Powerful stuff. So my sheep hear my voice. Go back to your outline. Matthew eleven fifteen. 15. We won't go there, but it's in your outline. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Jump over to 1, Corinthians, or 1 John 4. <coughs> excuse me, verses 5 and 6. Now, Jesus is just talking about the spirit of, of Antichrist, the spirit of Christ, and, and greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world, verse 4. And it, look at this, he says, They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world. They speak the language of the world, and the world hears them. He's talking about these Gnostics that he's dealing with. The world hears that. They hear on that frequency. Next verse. We are of God. How, well, how do I know I'm of God? Well, he that knows God hears us. Can you see it? You know, if, if you're not hearing on God's frequency, everything we're saying is going to sound like Charlie Brown's teacher. What do you talk about? Oh, Jesus or something like that. Covenant things. I don't know what it was. We are of God. He that knows God hears us. He that is not of God hears, heareth not us. Hereby, or here's how you know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error by what you can hear. It's not just hearing sound waves. It's hearing the spirit of what God's communicating. Hallelujah. Go to uh, John 8, 47. John 8, 47. Look at this. He that is of God hears God's words. The word there for words is rhema, the revealed word of God. He that is of God hears God's words. This is Jesus talking. Ye therefore hear them not because you're not of God. I didn't say this. Jesus said it. Yes. This is part of being a disciple. And you say, well, the, I don't really hear God. Yes, you do. You may not know it, but you do. You're hearing God right now. That's right. Are you saying you're God, Chris? No, I'm not. But I'm saying he's speaking through me. That's right. Amen. See, listen, listen. If, if every message you hear never challenges you to come up, it's probably not a new covenant message because God is always saying, come up, I got more for you. Never condemnation. The very fact that people hear on a condemnation frequency is an indicator that they're not being discipled. Because if, if every time you hear a challenge is condemnation, you're not hearing on the Jesus new covenant frequency. Hallelujah. Back to your outline. Jump over to the Jesus frequency. Um, Go, yeah, go to ah, disciples here through his word. I'm going to do that one. And we're going to, because this kind of leads me into the next one. Go, go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And this is going to lead us into the next point. Disciples hear Jesus accurately, but disciples hear through his word. This is so powerful. 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 17. For he received from God the Father, talking about Jesus, honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Next verse. And this voice which came from heaven, this audible voice which came from heaven, we heard, audibly heard, when we were with him in the holy mount or holy mountain. Next verse. This is so amazing. Watch this. We have also a more Sure word of prophecy. What could be more sure than an audible voice from heaven? Amen. What could be more sure than that? Here it is. Whereunto you do well that you take heed 
as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. We've talked about that. But jump to the next verse. What is this more sure word of prophecy? Now the prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, Revelation 19.10. Okay? But look at this. Knowing this first, remember? What's more sure than an audible voice from heaven? Knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture, of the scripture, is of any private interpretation. You realize what he's saying? He's saying, we have a more sure word of prophecy than an audible voice from heaven, and it's in the scripture. But most people would write, well, if God would just show up and show me something. He already has. I need a word from the Lord. Here you go. Amen. I got lots of words for you. Amen. This is God talking to you. Yeah. You know what I'm learning? When, For example, I, the Bible calls this the mirror of the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3.18, James chapter 1, verses you know, 25 on down, or actually verses 23, 24. It talks about this is the mirror of the Spirit. This is what I look like in my born-again spirit. So I ask myself, what does the mirror say? Well, I don't feel like I have any joy. What does the mirror say? It says I have joy. It says the joy of the Lord is my strength. It says it's my choice to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And if I'm down, it's because I'm letting myself be down and I'm not believing what God says. And if God says it, that's the truth. I don't care what I feel. This is where we got to go. If you will choose to say, I believe it. If God says it, that's the way it is. That settles it. And I'm going to act accordingly. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I'm going to choose to rejoice because to rejoice is a choice. And let his joy well up in me. Amen. It's so powerful, guys. It's so simple. We make it so hard because God moved me. God moved me. He's already moved. I like I heard Andrew say something one time I thought was powerful. He said he went in a meeting one time and he said, who wants to see God move? And everyone said, yeah, yeah. And he said, you're too late. He already moved 2,000 years ago. <laughs> so knowing this first, we have a more sure word of prophecy out of the scripture. And it says it's not of any private interpretation. That means it's, I don't decide what I want it to be. This is what God says. But it also means it doesn't pertain to me. It pertains to him. Next verse. One more verse. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Woo! Wow. You know, I want to say this to you. This is another PowerPoint. You know, in the old covenant, the Spirit of God would come on certain people for a work and then he would depart but in the new covenant because we're in christ because we relate through god through jesus go to john 1 i'll show it to you you say well this just means jesus no if you're born again it means you too yeah. are you hearing me look at this and i knew him not now watch this but that he sent me talk john the baptist to baptize with water and the same said unto me watch this upon whom you shall see the spirit descending and remaining and remaining on him the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit descended on Jesus, physical Jesus, and it remained. And if you're in Christ, the Holy Spirit is in you and he remains. He's not checking in and out. <sighs> Back to your outline. Jump down to point number three because this goes right together. Disciples hear Jesus accurately. Disciples know the word, number three, and they rejoice in his word. They don't just visit God's word. They have moved in. Disciples are all in for the Lord. Disciples are all in for the Lord. Go to Daniel chapter 3, verse 15. Now, how this, I'm going <laughs> to, this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or for you veggie tail peoples, Rack, Shack, and Benny. Okay, <laughs> right? So here's Rack, Shack, and Benny. And it says, and, and Nebuchadnezzar said, listen, when you hear this, you bow down, you worship me. Now look what Rack, Shack, and Benny said. Uh, Daniel 3, verses 15 through 18. 
Now if, now, if you be ready at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye shall fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is it? And, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? So this is a pretty big threat. Rack, Shack, and Benny, I mean Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be, if it be so, our God whom we serve, he is able to deliver us, right? From the burning fire furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Next verse. But if not, in other words, most people say, well, if we're burned up, well, if you're burned up, of course. They're not going to bow down because they're going to be dead, right? So what? But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. You know what they're saying? This isn't saying that, man, if God doesn't deliver us and we're burned up, we're still not bound down. Of course you're not bound down. You're going to be dead. This is saying, king, even if you change your mind and decide not to throw us in the fiery furnace, we're not bowing down. They were all in in their trust of God. If you throw us in, hey, listen, we're not bowing down. That's what he's saying. Hallelujah. Disciples are all in for God. They understand that these are days of heaven on earth. Go there. King James, Deuteronomy eleven twenty one. This is so good. Look at this. I, we, that your days may be multiplied. This is God's desire for us. This is in the old covenant. How much more in the new? And the days of your children, not only does it affect you, but your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven on earth. Now, what are the days of heaven on earth? Well, I know what it means. It means having more boats, more planes, more. That's not what he's talking about. It will back up to verse 18 and we'll see what days of heaven on earth are. Here they are. You ready? Therefore shall you lay up these my words, everybody say words, words, in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. Next verse. And you shall teach them God's words unto your children, speaking of the words of God when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. In other words, you're consumed with the word of God, and you shall write them upon the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. Next verse. Here it is, that your days may be multiplied and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as days of heaven on earth. Days are heaven, of heaven on earth are when the word of God's number one in your life. Yeah. It's not about what you have. It's about who has you and it's about what you're consumed with. If you're consumed with the word of God, you are experiencing days of heaven on earth. It doesn't get any better than that. You know, everything in this world's a temporary fix. Yep. You know, I've even uh, uh, discerned, and if it offends you, just get over it. Okay, I'm sorry. I just got to say it that way. But I've even seen, I watch people, even people my age, and it's like everybody's just, everybody's working for the weekend, or, or everybody's retired for the weekend. They're just living to have a good time. And listen, you got so much more purpose than that. Yeah. Yeah. When you fall in love with the word of God, I'm telling you, it's where the life is at. Yeah. This is what it means to be a disciple. If the things of the world are still attractive to you, look at your heart. All right, I'll go there. Go to 2 Corinthians 13, 5 from the Amplified Classic, please. I'm getting excited. I got so much more to go. Examine and test and evaluate your own selves to see whether you're holding to your faith and showing the proper fruits of it. Look at this. Test and prove yourselves. Not in a condemning way. Not Christ. Do you not yourselves realize and know thoroughly by an ever-increasing experience that Jesus Christ is in you unless you are counterfeits, disapproved upon trial and rejected. Test yourself. Make sure the fruits in my life are consistent with what I say I believe. I'm telling you, we've got so much life. We are so blessed. We are so called. We are so anointed. But you don't understand, I'm going through this. Everybody's going through something. Yeah. Hallelujah. Back to your outline. This is so good. 
Go to, go to, yeah, go to Psalm 119, 162. I want you to see it. We've mentioned it, but you need to see it. Disciples rejoice in God's word from the New King James. Psalm 119 says, I rejoice, 162, verse 162. I rejoice in your word as one who finds, who finds, who finds. Have you found it? Who finds, who finds, who finds great treasure. How many believe that on a heart level? If you're at this church, you probably believe it. Because we're going there, baby. Yes. I'm this close to being able to do a verse by verse of 1 John, but not quite ready yet. Because there's some verses I can't explain as well as I want to. But I'm telling you, this stuff is awesome. God is amazing. We are blessed. And guess what? Even when we exit this life, it gets gooder. Yes. <laughs> you know, I was... The Lord spoke this to me. He says, you will be blown away when you stand in my presence and you feel the amount of no condemnation. He goes, you've never really experienced that like it is when you're out of this physical body. Because we live in condemnation a lot of times. We're always being, it's like, everybody's always telling us what's wrong with us, even our own heart. Hey, you know what? My faith isn't what's wrong with, in what's wrong with me. It's in what's right with Jesus in me. Glory to God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And then, I'm gonna, then we're gonna, I'm going to share something about the next point, and then we'll get into that next week. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. I talked about this. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart. So what does it mean to sanctify or set apart the Lord God in my heart? What does that look like? Well, he's going to tell you. And be ready, always, be always ready to give a defense or an answer, the old King James says, to everyone... To everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, humility, reverence, right? Yes. The word there for defense or answer in the old King James is a word that means a reasoned out, thought out belief. In other words, you, you, you know what you believe and why you believe it and you can explain it. This isn't just for preachers. Amen. We're all preachers. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. You know, people say all kinds of goofball stuff and people don't know how to answer it. Hallelujah. Let, go, go, let me show you. Get, um, read your, go to your outline. Unless I can explain the doctrine clearly to those who ask, I have not heard it enough. I'll say that again. I'll read that again. Unless I can explain a teaching or what I believe clearly to those who ask, I have not heard it enough. We need to meritate, marinate and meditate upon these things. As it pertains to a truth, those who think they've heard it all have not heard it at all. Think about that. Those who think they've heard it all have not heard it at all. Now, <laughs> this is so good. I missed sharing to you about the name of Jesus, but I'll have to do that another time. I'm going to read this to you. This is from a book by Doug Stringer entitled Born to Die. It's a powerful book powerful book on the, the offerings in the Old Testament, how they point to Jesus. But I want to read this testimony to you. And here it is. God is real. God is real. It was 1993 and Bob had been coming to our Friday night worship services where I had been teaching an 18 or an eight week series on the work of the cross. I had just completed the final message in the series entitled Mission Accomplished. Bob had come to us as a skeptic, but now with tears in his eyes, he came down the aisle, he came to the cross, knowing the God of the Bible is as real today as he was to the Levitical priest. Many years later, Bob is still an integral part of our ministry. He has impacted hundreds of lives through the Jesus and the Steps ministry he founded, along with this ministry to AIDS patients. Who would have imagined, listen to this, that a study on the book of Leviticus could so profoundly change a man's life. A record truck driver who had for 19 years had been a hardcore heroin methadone, methadone addict. But that is the beauty of the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. It never goes forth void. I'm telling you. The more we see Jesus in the entirety of the word of God, the more we understand that those offerings are pointing to Jesus. Can I give you an example? Sure. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Whoever else said, yeah. I'm going to anyhow, so don't even... <laughs> From the King James, the old King James, the one that Moses and Paul and Jesus used. 
Look, what, I forgot to give him the verse. Proverbs 14, 9. Watch this. See, it's so powerful. There were, there were five offerings under the old covenant. I'm just trying to show you how powerful the word of God is. There, there was the, the, the burnt offering. There was the meal offering. In the old King James, it says meat offering, which is not good. It's the grain offering or the meal offering. And then there was the peace offering, the voluntary offerings. Then there was the sin offering. And then there was the trespass offering, right? Now, sin offering and trespass offering were both mandatory. Jesus fulfilled all these, every one of them. They're all embodied in the one sacrifice, all right? But look at this. I used to read this. I'm going to give you an example. These are the nuggets that are everywhere in the Word of God. I'm telling you guys, days of heaven on earth are in the Word of God. Amen. Remember the rhema Word of God? That which, which causes us to talk, that which, which uh, because it's, it's remarkable and noteworthy. Yeah, that's powerful. But look, I read this, I said, remember the five offerings. Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. And I thought, what in the world is that talking about? Does that mean fools go, at sin? Is that what it means? I'm just being real. That's how I think. But you know what that word there for sin is in the Hebrew? A-S-H-A-M, asham, if, you pronounce, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. That's not the point. It literally means the trespass offering. It's the same word that's translated trespass offering. Now watch this. How does this apply and how does this look in our life? The sin offering was the offering that was mandatory because it was an offering for the entity of sin. That, that men, men were sinners, right? Amen. They needed that sin to be taken care of. The trespass offering had to do with the consequences of that sin, like sickness. Like sickness. So when people mock healing, they're mocking Jesus as the trespass offering. They're mocking that he paid the price. When people say you can't be happy, you can't have joy, you can't have peace, you can't have any of those things, you can't be prosperous. <laughs> Sorry. Not really. God forbid that God would bless preachers with money. Poverty is a demonic doctrine. Poverty is a curse. But when people make fun of that, they're mocking Jesus as the trespass offering. Wow. Oh, that's cool. How exciting is the word of God? You know what we're talking about today? Being a disciple. Now I want to give you a heads up to where we're going in our next thing. And I could spend volumes of time on this. We're talking about disciples walking covenant commitment to their brethren. You know to step out of love is to step into fear. And the Bible says, perfect love casts out fear, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, right? So if perfect love casts out fear, then why do I deal with so much fear? And if God is love, same chapter, right? And he's perfect, he's complete, right? I shouldn't have any fear. Perfect love has to do with what I allow to work in my life towards you. That's why it says in Proverbs eleven seventeen, the merciful man does good to his own soul. To his own soul. But he that is cruel troubles his own flesh. Yes. The word merciful means the covenant man or woman. He does good to himself or herself. But he that is cruel to his brethren troubles his own soul. This is why we're commanded to walk in love. If I'm walking in perfect love, fear will automatically go. See, you can tell where, you're, where the love's not being matured in your life by your fear level. That's not a condemning thing. That's, I love it when I find out I'm the problem. Because God can work on me. I can allow him to work on me and I can change. But if God's the problem and he's the Lord and he changes not, I got some serious problems. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So this is powerful stuff. We're going to get into this. Next, I mean, I got so many things. Everybody say this. Say, God, God has called me has to be a disciple, be a disciple of, Jesus. of Jesus. Amen. 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 That's what's going to change the world. Yep. Let me tell you something else about disciples. I mentioned this last week. Disciples make disciples. Yes. Disciples reproduce. The Lord showed me this one time. He said, said when is the last time you've seen a five-year-old having children in the natural why doesn't that happen? Because their bodies aren't 
mature enough to reproduce, right? But when you become older, your body matures physically, right? Likewise, the reason, if I'm not a disciple of Christ, I'm not going to be able to reproduce. I'm not going to be able to have an answer. You know, one of the things I've learned about even going in the jail, these guys ask some tough questions, but I love it. I love it. It doesn't mean I have all the answers and I'm not afraid to say, you know, I don't know, but I'll look into it. But I'm telling you, I want to grow and we are called to know. The more you know him, just like last night, I'm praying and I'm meditating on, on uh, how the Father seeks such, the worship. And then I saw that today. Oh my word, the word worship means to kiss the hand. It means to kiss towards. It means to kiss. The Father's craving your kiss. Isn't that awesome? And then he said, kiss the son, so it's all through Jesus. That was awesome to me. And then I went to bed and I got carnal. And I was thinking about an ACDC song. <laughs> and I thought, man, that's a cool lick. So I pulled out my phone and I named the song and it showed me the lick. So I got my guitar and <laughs> time to go to bed. <laughs> I mean, you know, God doesn't care. He's, God's not like we... You know, how dare you? I, he thinks it's a cool lick, too. I just wish they would have used it for the Lord. Amen. So, anyhow. So, we're going to get in. Do you learn anything? God is so good. Oh, I wanted to get into the name of the Lord as a strong tower because that's a covenant thing, but I did not get there, so we'll have to do that another time. And the righteous run into it and are safe. Literally means we're elevated out of danger. So good. If I could have the prayer team up here, if anybody desires prayer. The, I know this in my knower, that the enemy desires the body of Christ to be shallow. And it's not just having more information in your head. It's having more revelation in your heart. It's knowing him better. God wants us to know him. And it all starts with understanding how much we are loved. How do you know how much you're loved? Well, let me, let me show you. Jesus prayed this in John 17. And in verse 23, he said that the same love the father has for him is the same love he has for you. Now listen, that sounds great. We can amen it. But do I believe that on a heart level? I guarantee you. I'm, wor I'm allowing God to do, I'm, I'm working on my heart with the Holy Spirit. And I'm saying, Lord, I need a revelation of how much I'm loved. And so do you. Because see, that's the key to loving other people. Sometimes we talk about loving the brethren, loving other people. So we grab those things in our own strength. Well, I'm going to do that. No, you do it with his love. Jesus, or the Apostle John said in John 4 verse 10, here in his love, not that we love God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the, big word, propitiation or satisfaction for our sins. Knowing you're loved is the key to loving. We love him because he first loved us, or we love because he first loved us. See, it's so powerful, guys. And, and I'm going to say, we're, we're going to, if you want, if you've never been born again, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But there's another work of grace I want to talk about. And that's the baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire. Yeah. And the baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire is accompanied by a prayer language. And the Bible says you can build yourself up on your most holy faith. In Jude 1 verse 20, one chapter in Jude, the next verse says you will keep yourself in the love of God. Or one translation says you'll, always, you'll stay in the boundaries where God's love can reach and bless you. You are so loved, guys. But it takes the Spirit of God to reveal to me how much I'm loved because I can't comprehend it with this because you know you look at the world and say Lord I prayed about this why isn't thing changing why isn't this it's never God Amen. it's always my heart the Bible says see if your heart condemns you that's what stops God's manifestation in areas of your life now don't be condemned over that just recognize God's not condemning you for if your heart condemns you, God's greater than your heart. He knows all things. If your heart condemns you not, then have you confidence towards God. You see it? God's not the variable, but some people are still stuck in, well, maybe God's holding out on me. God's not holding out on you. Jesus sat down on the right hand of the Father. 
Not because he was tired, but because the work was finished. The next thing he will do is physically return. But in the meantime, he's given us everything. The only thing that stops it is the condemnation in our heart. That's it. That's it. I've been really pondering this and thinking, Lord, I believe your word. I'm, I want to believe your word at every level. Now, what if you battle this or that? There's no condemnation. The very fact that we, we receive condemnation, well, if I was really spiritual, I wouldn't be dealing with this or that. No, you're in a, you're in a battle, but you win. We need to receive no condemnation. Jesus told the woman in John 5, he said, she's, uh, and, and the woman caught in the act of adultery in John chapter 8, has no man condemned you in John chapter 8? And he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. See, the key to not sinning is no condemnation. The key to the promises of God is a heart that's not condemned. How does God see you? Just like Jesus, if you're born again, if you're in Christ. Isn't that exciting? Hallelujah. So if you need prayer for anything, these folks want to pray with you. Let us agree. You know, can, before we go, let's just, can we just pray one for another? Is that okay? Amen. Let's pray for each other. God's been dealing. I'm not there as far as I, but I've been doing this more and more with people. I'll just say, hey, hey, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. I've been trying to make this a constant habit because it doesn't have to be a big, fancy, flowery prayer. It's just, just Lord, I'm telling you, God moves through those prayers. So let's put your hand on your neighbor if they will allow you. And just pray one for another. I'll just lead you. Say, Lord, I thank you that we're blessed. And I just agree with my brother or sister that the blessing of God that's on them would be stirred up and would increase. I decree that this week they will be in the right place at the right time. Lord, we thank you for the angels of God that are all around us. And I thank you, Lord, that we're blessed. Let the joy of the Lord that we have just well up on the inside of us. And let we choose to cooperate with what you said is true of who we are in Christ, in Jesus' name. Amen. You're blessed. Have an amazing week. Hallelujah. Thank you, Debbie.